Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Discovery Debrief, a podcast that dives headfirst into the proverbial deep end of the latest trek into the final frontier, Star Trek Discovery. I'm co-host Chris Clow, and I'm joined as usual by members of our bold panel of Star Trek franchise explorers, including Rachel Clow. Hey. <laughs> Zaki Hassan. Hello. And Cicero Holmes. Always trust in mud. <laughs> oh, I missed that. It's been too long. Uh, well, speaking of that, sorry that we've been away for so long. Obviously, we haven't had new episodes of Discovery to discuss, but we certainly wanted to come back a little sooner than this in order to, uh, well, talk about the show's first season in its entirety now that we have the chance to do that. Uh, while we haven't nailed down what our actual release schedule is going to be as we await Discovery Season 2, uh, you can certainly count on our brand of insights, commentary, and general Trek gushing from this panel we've assembled going forward. We'll have a little bit of, uh, of an indication about what's next by the time we get to the end of this episode. But first things first, we have a very special guest joining us to talk about Discovery Season 1 a partner of our good friend Cicero Holmes over at the Spawn on Me podcast. And this has been a long time coming, but thankfully he had an opening in his schedule and was able to join us for this episode. So ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Sharif Jackson. Sharif, thank you so much for joining us. How you doing? I'm good, man. I'm super excited. I've uh, definitely been a fan of the show. Uh, listen intently. I think you guys put out, put, put out a great product. Uh, even despite Cicero being on the show. Um, <laughs> so I am super, super happy to uh, be a part. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, it's really nice to hear. I'm, gl I'm glad that you've been enjoying it so far. Uh, and obviously, it's great to have you. I mean, Cicero has been talking you up pretty significantly. And uh, I didn't even realize that you were a Star Trek fan until he started you know, poking me with his elbow and saying, hey, we should get him on the show. So we're really happy to have you. Uh, first thing we like to do when we bring anybody aboard is to initiate a good, solid Trek oriented introduction. So Sharif, tell us a little bit about yourself and more specifically, what is the Star Trek franchise to you and why do you call yourself a fan of it? Sure. Um, so I am, I do a bunch of things. I've, I participate in what we call the gig economy, I guess. So I do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a math, I'm a, I'm a math and physics tutor. Uh, that, that's kind of my, I'm a business owner, so I own a math and physics tutoring business. Um, so I do that most of the day, tutoring kids and adults on uh, math and physics, um, from elementary school math to calculus and physics. Um, I'm also a um, adjunct professor um, at the University of Wisconsin for a video games and learning class. Um, so we talk about uh, like diversity within video games. Um, and like how they're used as like learning devices to to uh, to reflect the world, and uh, very soon, as in in a couple of days, I will be doing some substituting at a local charter school for uh, elementary school math. Um, so some sixth, seventh, eighth grade uh, pre-algebra algebra stuff. Um, so that's kind of what I do in terms of the day to day. Um, Otherwise, you know, I uh, co-host the uh, Born on Me podcast with Cicero, um, so we talk about games there. Um, I do some uh, YouTube videos under the Gaming Looks Good uh, banner, um, and I also do my, like, science-related uh, work under Science Looks Good. So I kind of have my hands in in a bunch of different, uh, different buckets. That's um, awesome. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I keep it interesting. I don't like to be bored. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, what is a Star Trek franchise to me? I would say that what the Star Trek franchise to me is like, I guess the most, the most general way I can put it in the, in the fewest words is like nerdy politics <laughs> is really what the franchise is. To me. <laughs> um, I kind of grew up, I was the kind of kid, like I watched the news, I read the paper and like all that kind of stuff. And I just love like discussing things even when I was like a kid. And Star Trek was one of the only shows that sort of combined like my love of also like kind of like just general aliens and space and stuff that I liked as like a kid with just these like hardcore discussions about like the politics and ethics of what happens when we interact with different species or we choose to go against the prime directive and when not to and like all that kind of stuff. So like 
nerdy politics. I'm really all in it for like those hardcore, like those hard decisions that like the, the that like the captain and like the other officers have have to make on a daily basis. I just love that part of the franchise. Um, and yeah, and like I call myself a fan, you know, because you know I kind of grew up watching Star Trek. I mean, that was one of the first. Um, you know, I, I would say non cartoon or animated shows that I actually like would keep up with on a regular basis, you know? Um, and while I wouldn't say I'm a, I'm a Trekkie per se, um, I've definitely always been a fan. Um, and, and like, I've always been, you know, interested whenever a, uh, new series comes, c- comes around or a new movie. I've always been, uh, interested in uh how it affects kind of like the zeitgeist of uh culture sure oh, that's a great answer and uh you know one of the things that we often do here on the show in the opening segment is tell people exactly how we've engaged with the franchise since the last time we recorded but since this is your first time with us give us an idea of how you regularly interact with the franchise uh when you choose to watch star trek today because you said you're not necessarily hardcore but you have an immense appreciation particularly for the thematic angles that the franchise likes to delve into when it comes to society so how does star trek sort of interact with you uh nowadays besides obviously the fact that we just got got through the first season of a new show well i have like a short list of movies that i kind of rotate around when i uh, can't figure out kind of what to watch Mm -hmm. um and uh you know uh star trek two and three are always in there Um, okay those are two of like sort of my favorite movies of all time um so i watch those definitely usually a couple of times every year Um, Mm -hmm. i just absolutely love them um and I typically um, – my favorite Star Trek episode of all time I watch um, fairly frequently as well, which is Blink of an Eye from uh, Voyager series. Um, so I generally um, interact with Star Trek uh, on those levels. I also love to like jump into Reddit just to see what, what uh, people are whining about. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, and, uh, as of late, yeah, it's been, you, you know, like, like every time I kind of catch up, I like talk to see, I'm like, Hey man, did you see this? what do you think about this? You know? Um, and the good thing about, um, discovery is that it's one of the few shows that my girlfriend and I watch together. Oh, cool. Um, so it's also kind of become like this thing, you, you know, that's like a part of our relationship basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, uh, it's it's been cool to like uh, look forward to it in that aspect and like uh, discuss all the themes with like her, like we've, we've had a lot of agreements and several disagreements <laughs> as to uh, not only in terms of trying to predict it, but like disagreeing as to what motivations were and like uh, what we think should have happened and uh, that kind of stuff. So yeah, it was, it's uh, really been um, fun engaging with the franchise as of late. Yeah, I I think, uh, you know, we've talked about that to varying levels over the course of the time that we've had this show that, you know, modern society and Star Trek are going together pretty well so far, it seems, you know, just like the the way that we actually consume television now. And uh, it's cool that you you and she can sit on the couch together and absorb it. And uh, Cicero said something similar is a show that he and his partner watch together even though she's not necessarily or at least wasn't necessarily a big franchise fan and i'm so last question then for you before we uh open up to the whole panel because everybody on this panel has different answers for what their favorite trek series and movie is obviously you've mentioned an episode you mentioned a couple of the movies and i've I, so far we haven't heard a star trek 3 as a favorite movie but uh if you had to pick your favorite series and nail down your single favorite movie, what are they and why? Favorite series is tough for me because I have like a personal favorite, but I have one that I think the quality is better. Sure. Um, my personal favorite is Voyager. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the series that, that I kind of grew up watching from beginning to end. Um, I was really introduced to Star Trek by watching the next generation when it used to come on late night on syndication in the New York area. 
Mm-hmm. So like I didn't really watch it from the beginning live because like I was a little young at that time and I was definitely uh, too young to catch the like original series as it was on live. So I got interested in Star Trek through like syndication. So like when I heard that um, UPN, the, uh, the uh, network was like coming out and that Voyager was going to start. I got super excited because like I was like, "Hey, here's a Star Trek series I can literally that I can watch grow from the beginning." Right. You know, um, so like uh, that'll always be my personal favorite um, because like it's the one that I experienced live, um, and like and like I remember I would pick up like you know TV Guide to like see like uh, what they're saying about it and like all that kind of stuff. So um, definitely my personal favorite i will say that i think that the next generation to me is probably the highest quality in terms of the thematic stuff that we talked about and like the crew and sort of the like emotional journey i i think that it's a a better series to me but voyager is my like personal favorite sure yeah and i'm i'm kind of in a similar boat i have a personal favorite in the original series but if I had to choose what I thought was like an objective best, then my my choice was Deep Space Nine. But the, the the nice thing about Star Trek is that if we love Star Trek, then we all have a baseline on which to agree. You know, right. more Star Trek is always going to be preferable to less yeah, Star Trek. Oh, I I I, I gotta give the movie. I got to give the movie. Yeah. So I I it's really hard for me to pick between two and three because to me it's like one big movie, and like I guess if 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 you count four, you know, it's one big arc, like story right. arc. Um, if I had to pick, probably would wow. be three, though. Probably would be three. You are um, the first. You are the f- if, if we ever have a Discovery Debrief Hall of Fame, then you've just earned your spot in it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, th- you know, I, I just I think I loved the the impact of what two did to Kirk's personality. And mm-hmm. I feel like how he reacted to that and how it changed him as a captain is what made three better to me. Like uh, two was sort of the, you know, like you saw him kind of, you know, like facing Khan and like slightly unraveling. And I felt like three, like you really got like the, um, like the payoff from that experience, um, you know, and, 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 and like, you know, as, as like a math and physics person, you know, I just love anything that involves like, you know, terraforming and all that stuff, which like I love in like part two. And again, like to see like the reaction and the payoff from that in like three is why I tend to love three the most. So, well, and it has some great character moments too. I mean, you can't overlook the fact that Captain Kirk's son David, died no, in that movie. David. And you. I mean, yes. it's it's hard to watch. <laughs> okay, sorry. Right. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Right. Red alert. Spoilers for Star Trek Three. But uh, I mean, also, how can you not at least get a smile on your face with Grand yes. Theft Enterprise? You know, I mean that that moment is it, that movie to me is way more eminently watchable than people give it credit for. So uh, I can absolutely understand that perspective. Yeah, and and like I just love like the spiritual angle with the Katra and sure. sort of like, you know, like I just thought that that was like a beautiful thing and like sort of, I feel like a lot of sci-fi tends to, you know, not take on spiritual things because they're almost seen as sometimes like mutually ex- exclusive. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love how they did that. Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. Well, uh, well, thank you very much for joining us. Looking forward to this with you and, uh, should be fun. Should be a lot of fun. But uh, we do still have a bit of a groove to get back into before we jump into the actual discussion that brings us here. So obviously, it's been way too long. It's been about a month since the regular panel last convened. So how have you guys been engaging with Star Trek since we last recorded, now that Discovery is on its break? Uh, Zachy, how you doing? And how have you been engaging with Star Trek, if at all? Because you are monstrously busy man <laughs> uh well i'm doing well uh, i am busy and uh the way i most recently engaged with star trek is i just recorded uh my commentary track uh for the nostalgia theater podcast on star trek 5 the final frontier with my friend glenn greenberg so excellent that's going to be dropping in like two days so 
Great. So yeah, probably by the time this episode is available. So if you like listening to Zachy talk about Star Trek, then go listen to him talk about its worst movie. <laughs> quite, quite a lot of fun. We got opinions. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm actually really looking forward to that. Uh, you know, Star Trek V is a movie that I have so many conflicted feelings about just because it starts off so strong. And to me, it even has – it might have the best score of the original movies. Uh, I mean, Jerry Goldsmith just it's brought it. definitely a great score. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At least it has that going for it. And but, and for um, me, uh, Track 5 is the very first Star Trek I saw in the theaters. So uh, oh. much, much like Superman 3, which is the first movie I ever saw in the theater, I, I have difficulty being entirely objective about what is objectively a terrible movie. Sure. Yeah. That, and that's a, an understandable perspective. Well, that just makes it all the more interesting. I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. Rachel, what have you been up to? I think you're doing okay. I've, I mean, I've seen you the most of the rest of our panelists over the last month. Yeah, I've been doing all right. Yeah. yeah. All right. No. You know, good read. Good read. Yeah. I am good. Um, what have I been doing? I've been watching Deep Space Nine, like mm-hmm. always. Yeah. You've transitioned sort of away from those early season TNG to jumping back into the middle of your Deep Space Nine. Rewatch. Yeah, I think you've been steering me. I haven't been uh, steering oh. you. Oh, oh, well. No, 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 no. <laughs> because last night, you and I love Quark episodes, and there was a Quark episode That's that true. was next. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't often There's go- Quark and Moogie episode. Quark and Moogie. The and, best kind of Quark episode. And the Negus. And Brunt. Yeah. FCA. That's true. Yeah. How and could you- Anytime uh, Jeffrey Combs shows up, I'm happy. Yeah, whether it's Brunt or Wei Yoon or- uh, or Shran. Shran. Yeah, yeah, everybody loves Shran. But well, Shran should be in my bracket. Oh. Oh yeah, we'll we'll we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. But um what you also finished Drastic Measures? Yes, with a qualifier that I was on a plane when I finished it and so right. there are some hazy pieces where I may have fallen asleep. Well, you'll you'll rectify that though because we we have a we have a book to talk about yes, pretty soon. Yeah. I will I will listen to it while I am conscious. There you go. I'm always always <laughs> preferable to unconscious. Cicero, my friend, how are you? And what have you been up to? And how have you been engaging with our favorite spacefaring franchise? Uh, I am doing well. And uh, I have been pretty busy in the world of Trek uh, since we last spoke. Um, Yeah. So I guess. um, Oh, do tell. First things first, I was uh, on a show on the Incomparable Network uh, called Random Trek, which also uh, Shreve Jackson was on uh, for a while back to talk about a two-parter. Uh, I was on to talk about a one-parter. Uh, it was episode 174. It, we talked about uh, the uh, TNG episode Night Terrors. Very interesting uh, reception that yes, that episode yes, got. It was, uh, it was a very special episode of TNG, uh, and, and 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 I had a <laughs> I had a blast uh, recording recording that episode. So if you guys have a chance uh, and want to. Uh, jog down memory lane of TNG, uh, please, I, I implore you to go and check that out. Um, let's see. I am, I have also finished, uh, listening to drastic measures. Uh, so I am looking forward to, yes. uh, taking some time out and, uh, talking about that whenever we can reconvene and do so. Uh, so, th- so that's going to be great. I, mm-hmm. uh, was, I did it on my commute. So, uh, unlike Rachel, I wasn't sleeping, uh, at, at any point. <laughs> yes. Thank you very Good. much. That's responsible. Thank you very much. So, and, 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 uh, yeah, little caveat, I drive for my commute so that, you know, let me fill in that blank. So, uh, it's a good thing that I wasn't sleeping, uh, during my commute. And then, uh, the other part of uh, my engagement with Trek is has been completing. I haven't completed yet, but completing my complete watch through of Sharif Jackson's very favorite uh, series in the Star Trek universe, Star Trek Voyager. And uh, nice. I have not. I am in season six for those people that are wondering, and I am on episode six of season six. I've, I've kind of slowed down. I've been doing about an episode, an episode and a half every day. Um, there are a lot of episodes, y'all. Um, <laughs> but I have not reached 
Sharif's very favorite episode in all of Star Trek, Blink of an Eye. It is about six episodes away. It is season six, episode 12. So I am eagerly looking forward to uh, taking taking a, a viewing of the very best episode that Sharif Jackson says uh, is is his favorite. Um, it's a guy I know to dress as Worf. So I trust... I trust his judgment on uh, very good episodes of Star Trek. So that's interesting. We'll have to we'll have to discuss that when once you actually do get past it. Uh, so you you have seen then? Um, I have the seen the Equinox. Equinox. So in, in fact, I was just talking about the Equinox um, uh, just earlier today, and I got that one confused with the episodes because it's it's an episode with uh, two. The broken, oh, the equinox is the is the is the starship. So I got that one confused with the one where there were two uh, enterprises stuck in, like they were like just just out of out of flux with each other, out of sync with each other, and there were two two crews. But yes, I did oh, get right. to see yeah. the equinox, and the equinox was a great episode. It reminded me of. Uh, um, yeah, so like that was the end of season five, the beginning of season six. Uh, it reminded me a lot of, uh, some BSG when, you know, when BSG in, in that series where they found another battle star and they had the, you know, the, the rival captains and, and everything that was going on with those. So, you know, you kind of, you kind of had that sense that, that those things were going to happen. Uh, during the course of, of the, of those two episodes, but they were fun to watch. Definitely. Sure. And how's the show just in general holding up as you make your way? So you the, the more that I watch it, the more that I like it, the more that I, I kind of understand the relationships between Janeway and the rest of the crew. And, and, you know, like it, it, it feels like a cheat to call her matronly. Um, because, you know, I, I feel like that is a word that's kind of tossed around cavalierly when whenever you want to have uh, some some sort of positive superlative to say about a, a female character, uh, especially one in command. Um, but, I, you know, so I was trying to find the 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 right word uh, for for the relationship that I think Janeway has with with her. Uh, with with the rest of the crew, and I think it's like she's like a headmaster or a principal of a school of a like of a of a private school where okay. she has this relationship with with the rest of the crew where she is both authoritarian uh, authoritarian and you know close to best friends you know like she she knows each and every one of the her crew intimately um and and she can both be the the person that doles out punishment but also be the person that doles out comfort with with you know with equal equal agility um and and I can really appreciate that from mm -hmm. her and uh for the most part I really like the crew and I feel like you get a lot of time to learn who the crew is. And, and even those characters that some people don't like, like Neelix, um, there is, there are redeeming qualities of them and you really get an understanding of who these people are, uh, fundamentally and, and, and there are enjoyable bits to, to them. Yeah, you know, I That's never. You, you make, yeah, you make uh, Janeway you know, sound like Mrs. Like, Garrett. That was what I was thinking of too. Was like, <laughs> right, right, right. Oh. They've got the hair. They got the same hair. <laughs> you know, I never got the Neelix hate personally. I mean, he's he he wears some gaudy clothes, uh, and he's he chooses to be happy. But that's far from an unlikable uh, well, perspective from him. There, at least, there I was think. But, uh, uh, there was definitely some talk when I was on Random Trek about uh, Neelix's relationship with Kess. Um, yeah, that that can be problematic. I, yeah, I wound up calling yeah. him the R. Kelly of the of the Delta Quadrant. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, it, there there definitely seems to be a. Uh, a preponderance of of uh, dislike for Neelix and his kind of weird 
plucky attitude, I guess. Is- He's so loyal. I don't know how. I mean, like I've heard him equated with Star Trek's right. Jar Jar Binks, no, and I just no. don't. Oh, no I don't understand that at all. I don't no, think that's an apt no. comparison by any stretch of the imagination. Yes, yeah, but, he uh, gets compared with flocks a yeah. lot. Does he? I've never been in a conversation like that. That's interesting. I mean, uh, I can see some base similarities. He's but, the, he's the makeup I mean, alien on that crew. Huh, with with Fox is the makeup alien on 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 the other crew. Yeah, the, I, you know what, what? What is funny is in Voyager? There's, <laughs> so there's one thing that people don't talk about a lot when it comes to Voyager, and and it's something that I've learned to appreciate. You know, everyone talks about Janeway and Seven of Nine, and you know they hate for Neelix. The Doctor mm-hmm. is one of the greatest characters. And in all of Star Trek, the Doctor oh, is. I, I think he's phenomenal. He no, his is like the is the journey he goes through in that series is amazing, and is really yeah. He represents like what Star Trek is to me. Mm. Well, and, 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 and oh and my god, Picardo yeah. just made a meal oh out of gosh. Oh, he, he is did. phenomenal. And he, all, I mean, unlike a character like Data, right. he's much more in control of his own destiny than uh, than some of these other outsider care and you know presuming that he qualifies in the same sort of vein as like spock or odo uh or data for that matter because he's far more human than all of them but uh weirdly enough even though he's a hologram but no it's okay so let me let me end this by asking you one one final question is or are, are any of the other series like deep space nine or the next generation or enterprise in danger in your mind of being super I, I cannot by I will, Voyager. And I will not answer that in good faith until I finish the series. Um I will say though Fair enough. that yesterday I watched Tinker Tenor Doctor Spy and I absolutely love that episode. If if Ooh, yeah. if anyone wants an episode to show you how great that the doctor is that episode is just phenomenal. It's it, you know it's not heavy on the drama, um, but it is it is heavy on the doctor and, and it man it really if you don't love the doctor by the end of that episode you have no heart you have no soul you're you're worse than a hologram. Doctor, doctor, give me. <laughs> all right, all right. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I I couldn't I couldn't resist. All right, fair enough. Well, it seems like uh, we've all had. Quite a lot. Well, oh, me, right. Um, Mostly, what I've mostly been up to is I've I've tried to revisit Discovery on an irregular basis, but I've also just been. uh, I have not yet finished Drastic Measures, but I am imminently going to, and uh, mostly taking in episodes of the original series again because I always have to dip back into the adventures of that crew. I did briefly revisit the first half of Star Trek Into Darkness last week, mostly on a whim. And, uh, you know, as far as the the current movie series is concerned, that one, to me at least, is probably the weakest, but it definitely has standout elements that are the strongest of all three movies thus far, and I think that's personified by Benedict Cumberbatch. But... uh, (laughs) I'm just kind of all over the place, like most of the time with Star Trek absorption. And I've been reading the comics that have been coming out. The The third issue of the Discovery miniseries, The Light of Kalos, came out. And it delves a little bit more specifically into Takuvma's past, which is pretty interesting. And I think next month, Star Trek Discovery Annual Number 1 comes out, which tells the story of how Dr. Oh, nice and Lieutenant Stamets first met. So I'm really looking forward to that. But uh, other than that, we do have uh, a couple of brief news items that I want to get through, one of which will, I think, directly tie into what's going to happen in season two of the show. So why don't we do that first? So the biggest news related to Star Trek and more specifically Discovery likely has to do with the scene that was deleted from the season finale, but that will apparently have repercussions related to the upcoming second season. It's a bit of a rarity, but CBS released this fully finished package deleted scene on official Star Trek social media channels, which depicts former Emperor Giorgio being recruited by none other than Section 31. Now... 
Over the course of this show, we've spent a fair amount of time, especially in the early going of the first season of Discovery, speculating whether or not the Federation's own unofficial black operations organization would be making their presence known in the show. Now that Section 31 will apparently have a place in the second season, how do you guys feel about the possibilities this represents? Sharif, why don't we start with you? Well, I'll say this first. One thing with the um, marketing of this show, I was very happy for uh, the character of uh, Giorgio. Um, so kind of navigating through the show, you, you know, at like first I was sort of upset in the middle and then I was a little happy when sort of, you know, when, when she was sort of reintroduced to, 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 to the show. So in general, I'm kind of biased. Anything that's pro JoJo stuff mm -hmm. um, is uh, cool, um, and I think I think this is kind of a good fit to me. Um, her with uh, Section Thirty One. I mean, like she's definitely you know sort of dark and autonomous, and sort of like not really a a uh, person that lives by the rules. I mean, like she kind of makes her own rules. I feel like yeah. Um, so I can definitely see her fitting in, but I can see her also like, you know, um, I don't think she likes to be tied down as much. So if she did choose to work with them, I think that she would essentially use them for what she could and then try to figure out something else after. So I think anything that's, that's putting Giorgio in new situations where she can screw people over. I'm all for <laughs> well said Cicero section 31. Well, I mean, the the, so much of that is, two. is wide open, right? So the, I mean, the first thing is, um, you know, can we talk about how they're going to integrate this? Cause I mean, they've, they've, so they've released all of this information in the off season and, and you know, and, and of course uh, all of those people that are, are plugged into discovery, have probably already seen this stuff. So they're already anticipating this, but, but in going into season two, they have to assume that there are people that don't know about this. So how are they going to introduce section 31 into the season proper? Um, well, and so, I mean, so that's one question, but the, but, but, you know, I guess the answer to this whole thing about, you know, Giorgio and section 31 and all that other stuff is it's great because now we, you know, we've, we've got, purpose for Emperor Jojo in, in the prime universe. Um, you know, because the, you know, the way it was kind of left off at the, at the, in the season finale was she was just going to go off and, and have her own misadventures. Um, you know, similar to the way that, uh, Volk slash Tyler and Laurel were going to go off and do stuff with the Klingon Empire. Um, but but now she's got some purpose and, and Section 31, of course, is the perfect place for her to have these types of guided misadventures um, where where she can do the things that she wants to do kind of, you know, loosely guided by by, a, you know, a very flimsy set of rules. Uh, and, and she can go off and, you know, and, and of course the, the great thing is that that means that this character can come back during the course of the season. So, so, you know, we, we could, uh, wind up having Giorgio back on, you know, on the show proper, uh, for an episode or two in season two and hopefully season three and, and season four and beyond. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Zachy, you have to have some pretty strong feelings about the introduction of Section 31 into the fabric of this show. Uh, when you first saw that scene, how did it how did it strike you? Uh, I'm I'm a fan of Section 31 as as uh, part of the, the the Trek mythology, so it's cool to to see it confirmed as as part of uh, this series. I mean, because we know it it's you know, we know section 31 is in operation. Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less sanguine about the mirror universe as a continuing concern. Um, right. uh, so it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, well, this is one thing that I like. This is one thing that I don't like. We put them together and it's like, I don't know. I don't know how these two tastes are going to taste together, but I guess, <laughs> you know, I, honestly, I, I feel like section 31 uh, roping in Giorgio is kind of a way 
of getting her off the grid. So it, it provides an in-story explanation for like, why did we never hear from her again? Mm, and so I see. if we never hear from her again, I'll be totally fine with that. And, and not because I don't like seeing Michelle Yeoh, but I just, again, it's just, it, it it's just, it, it's, it's just needless convolution. So, so I, I, I like her being wrapped up with them rather than sort of, you know, just farting around the cosmos as like space empress and, you know, having her own uh, kooky adventures. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Giving her structure. Yes. Right. Yeah. Rachel, Section 31, I know that you generally feel pretty strongly about the Section 31 episodes of Deep Space Nine. So introducing that into the fabric of Discovery? Yeah, we'll see if there's any episodes that even address it. Why didn't they include the scene in the episode if it was that important? It's a good question. It's a valid one. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think that's the question is why is this a bonus scene? Mm -hmm. Um, So that kind of makes me agree with Zachy that I think it's kind of a we're never seeing Giorgio again. Really? You think so? Uh, Why didn't they include it in the episode? Yeah, again, like they have no time constraints. It's streaming. Conceivably not. I don't know. Maybe they'll incorporate. I, I still don't know if this season is going to get a physical release or not. Maybe they'll incorporate it into the episode that way. I'm not sure. Yeah. No, I think it's uh, it's interesting. And I think Section 31 would fit in with the vibe of the show really well. But I don't know what direction they're going to take it in season two. So. Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, as for me, Section 31 to me is one of the most fascinating uh, less explored aspects of the Star Trek franchise. Um We've talked before in previous episodes about seeing their very early days in the uh, United Earth Starfleet uh, from which they take their name, the charter from which they take their name, uh, in the episodes of Enterprise that dealt with uh, Lieutenant Reed. And there was a pretty decent Enterprise tie-in novel that even roped Trip Tucker into being involved with Section 31. Obviously, that's not in continuity. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's that's a good novel. It gave some perspective on his "quote unquote" death in the series finale. Oh, spoiler alert for these are the voyages. Uh, oops, but uh, no, I mean, Section Thirty One to me, they're kind of enigmatic and oxymoronic in a way because as much as they seem to militantly believe in the ideals of the Federation. They also employ tactics that go against those ideals on a regular basis in order to uphold them. You know, it's uh, like the pretty, the pretty classic uh, problem, I guess, with uh, surreptitious intelligence agencies. But I'll never forget how much I loved Odo explaining to Dr. Bashir and Captain Sisko, you know, we shouldn't have been surprised about this. Oh. The, the Romulans have the tall Shi'ar. The Cardassians have the Obsidian Order. It only makes sense that a a galactic power like the Federation would have an organization like this, that they can say, well, we don't officially recognize them, but they're still easy to be a saint in paradise. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, all the credit in the world to deep space nine for, for bringing those kinds of complexities up. And then of course you have a legion of expanded universe creators like novelists and comic book writers and artists who have taken that concept and run with it through the Star Trek canon. Why like it, it makes the idea surrounding the the assassination of Chancellor Gorkon in Star Trek 6 that seems like something that section 31 could have been involved with. Obviously we don't have any canonical confirmation of that, but the I mean the shoe fits to a point, which is great fuel for a story that someone well, can tell, and, and you know. The, so the other thing this that is really happens exciting. that no one seems I, to talk I, about I, is we have the introduction of a trill um, or at least, at least an acknowledgement that the trill yeah. exists, um, that, you know, that we know about them in, in the 23rd mm-hmm. century. Although not the first one, <laughs> if you want to get into the weeds as we like to do, as we are wont to do right. in trials and tribulations of Star Trek, deep space nine, Jadzia Dax mentioned that one of her hosts got up close and personal with the hands of Leonard McCoy. And uh, that just brings brings a big smile to my face. Oh, good old doctor. He had the hands of a surgeon. He did. (laughs) 
Oh, I love that episode way, way too much. But uh, but you're right. I mean, that's really the only sort of ancillary continuity jab that we've gotten about the Trill in the 23rd century. This is far more overt and uh, is basically confirmation. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you guys, because ba- back when we had viewed episode three, you know, we saw those black badges on on Discovery. And we see this black badge in this deleted scene, which seems to indicate membership in Section 31. Does that place the first appearance of the Starship Discovery itself and some apparent Section 31 operatives on the ship in a different context well, it, at all? It definitely any of you guys? M- leads us to believe that, uh, you know, we, we kind of speculated before that Discovery itself was was potentially a – Black ops or a uh, black ops friendly ship, um, you know, with the spore drive and and you know everything about exactly, exactly, yeah, and and, and I'm, I'm three want to believe that uh, that 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 was intentional. That you know, the, I mean, the fact that you've got these openly, you've got these uh, these these. Uh, crew members on the ship that are clearly a member of of Section Thirty One. They they had badges that were different from everyone else's. Um, the ship was shrouded in secrecy. Uh, the things that they were doing on the ship, the spore drive itself, was something that was was uh, a closely guarded secret. It's still a closely guarded secret, even you know at the end at the end of the season. So I I mean I definitely do think that that. The role of the of the discovery was was that of some sort of clandestine ship, um, destined to be to be either piloted mm-hmm. or crewed or commanded by by people that are uh, within the intelligence community within Starfleet. I bet that they're kicking themselves for not getting a hold of Gabriel Lorca first, or at least the mirror version of Gabriel Lorca first. He would have been. Kind of a shoe in, I think, to Prime Universe Section Thirty One. Maybe, but, maybe uh, they're looking for regular Lorca. Maybe, maybe he's still there. Who knows? I don't know. I definitely want to see that guy again. Uh, anybody else have any final thoughts on Section Thirty One? No, I, I, I mean, I think it just fits into the you know the narrative that you know uh, Michael seems so surprised at the lengths that you know. That um, the Amaro and other people were were gonna do to win the you know to win um, the war when they came back near the end. So, yeah. so my thought immediately went to Section Thirty One when like that scene kind of played out and like they were <laughs> like you know we're just gonna commit genocide against you know anyone basically to win. That's a really good know? point. Yeah, she did seem very taken aback by how much they were willing to compromise the ideals of the Federation. And uh, yeah, that kind of, that's kind of the modus operandi of section 31 compromise the ideals in order to uphold them. Right. Yep. All righty. Yep. Very, very fundamentalist way of thinking about things. Yeah. No kidding. Machiavellian. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, we have a few other second season tidbits on the production side. Series co-creator Alex Kurtzman is going to direct the season premiere, which is scheduled to shoot sometime in April. Uh, We don't have an exact date, but I'm sure that production personnel will share pictures to Instagram like crazy when the cameras actually start rolling again. And that's all well and good, but we've also learned that Jonathan Frakes is going back to the franchise he calls home and will direct at least one more episode of the show in the new season, which warms my heart because I love Jonathan Frakes. Probably more than any (laughs) normal man should, but I do. Um, Another tidbit that came up about season two from WonderCon in Anaheim was some thematic information from the second season that came out of interviews with showrunners Aaron Harberts and Gretchen J. Berg. They talked about the idea of spirituality being a a pretty big component of of season two, which Sharif, it should sound interesting to you automatically. Oh, yeah. But uh, so spirituality in Star Trek, and they said, well, what's the role of serendipity versus science? Is there a story about faith to be told? Leaps of faith. We're dealing with space. We're dealing with things that can't be explained. And you have a character like Michael Burnham who believes that there's an explanation for everything. And they also specify it doesn't just mean religion, but it also means patterns in lives. And it means connections that you maybe can't explain who enters your life and who leaves your life. 
which just makes me think of Spock. Uh, we'll see how those kinds of things go. But the indelible impressions that people make, and uh, apparently that's going to be one of the linchpins of the ideas explored in season two. So science versus faith uh, was obviously one of the primary themes that dominated Deep Space Nine. But it sounds like Discovery wants to take things in a bit of a different direction. Do you guys feel like there's enough there around which to base potentially a whole I'm, season? I'm intrigued. Exactly. You, you know, I mean, that? as you said, uh, Deep Space Nine was able to find a a very rich uh, mine uh, to draw draw from. You know, for the entirety of that series, uh, I you know, with a lot of this stuff, it's it, you can see the good version and the bad version, and. And I'm always hopeful we'll see the good version. So I, I don't know how they're going to approach it, but I'm I'm curious to see it. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think there's yeah, there's absolutely. enough there to Cicero? build an entire series behind that, um, behind the the juxtaposition of uh, science and and spacefaring uh, civilizations with their belief in in uh, a higher power and religious you know religious uh, not zealotry but you know just religious dogma. So. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely enough for a season. These guys, these guys have have shown uh, that they're pretty good writers, so I, I trust them. Sure, Sharif, do you think that this is something that they can run with through the entire season, or just a portion of it, or do you want to see it maybe explored through the entire season? I do, with a caveat. I I really hope they hmm. don't go for this science versus faith thing mm -hmm. and go for a intertwining of the two. Oh, okay. Um, I think that that will be a lot more inter interesting to me. Um, and I think that they've kind of introduced that a bit with the mycelial network, um, which we don't understand exactly. We know it's sort of the fabric of the universe, but I think that they could try to mix that up with a bit of a supernatural or spiritual element to it. Um, and I think that by exploring that, that will be something that will be more Inter interesting to me because I think that the science versus faith thing is, I don't know, it's 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 a little more tropey to me, mm -hmm. um, and I think that it could lead to some kind of lazy episodes <laughs> where there's like someone, someone with a Bible, like you should believe this, and like someone with like the general theory of, of, of relativity, <laughs> like you should believe this, and like that's it. Well, and like you said, too, before, they don't necessarily need to be mutually exclusive concepts if they're explored in the right way. Exactly. And like uh, one thing, you know, like me being like a science tutor is, you know, many of the most famous scientists in the world were very spiritual and they sort of had this connection. So I, so I think that exploring that is a better story. I think there's definitely enough for a season's worth um, in there, but I doubt we will get that just because of the pace that discovery moved and how many different plot lines, storylines, they fit in one season. Yeah. I, 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 I will be surprised if they slow that down because they're going to be like, well, this worked. Let's try to cram like two or three seasons of, of story into one again. Mm -hmm. So like, we'll probably put that into like a third of the season. Sure. Would be my prediction, even though I think it should be the whole thing. <laughs> Excellent. Rachel, you've got to have some feelings about this too. Our resident uh, biology PhD candidate. I'm a bit of a contrarian. I think it sounds kind of boring. Oh, okay. All it's right. been Smooth. done. It's been it's been done in Star Trek, so you don't necessarily. <laughs> like, I was thinking of like the Shangri La or whatever, right? Where they go and they. Uh, it's Shockery, oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. See, that's top of my head. I didn't even to know God to go to that right away. Some nonsense like that. <laughs> I don't know. I I feel like there's. This, it could be so boring and tropey. Could be. But it probably won't be. I mean, they did a good job. This I, I feel like if you had told me, like, we're going to do a war, and I, uh, like, for the first season, I would have been like, ah, oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> haven't seen that before. Um, you who yeah. almost fell asleep in Captain America Civil War in the <laughs> theater. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, that being said, I'm really down for seeing some crazy space cults because okay. uh, right. I think that could be really interesting. Just sort of seeing like what kind of crazy religions are out there in the cosmos. Yeah. That's not something that we've seen a lot of in Star Trek. Maybe the closest that we've gotten are the, uh, oh, what was the name of the species in mirror mirror at the beginning? The Hulkins. They seem kind of like space hippies. 
at the beginning of Mirror Mirror and said, we, we can't give you our dilithium crystals because you could use them even in the destruction of one life. And that goes against everything that we believe. And we would die as a race if that happened. And Captain Kirk is like, whoa, all right. Uh, look, we'll, we'll try and prove to you, but we admire you. So, you know, don't, don't do anything rash. But uh, yeah, all right, well, we'll see how it goes with season two. But let's go back to season one and let's actually talk about this whole this whole introductory season of Star Trek Discovery. It's a pretty it's a pretty interesting and wide ranging topic of discussion. So I'm gonna try and moderate this relatively heavily. Uh, and I'm gonna try and get some of the expository stuff out of the way as efficiently as possible. But uh, let's get ready to transition to talking about Star Trek Discovery season one, the prologue. So I think the thing that makes the most sense in approaching this is to go through the major beats of each of the two chapters. So let's begin with, well, the beginning. So we've all had time to ruminate on what Discovery's place is in the wider canon. The surprise should have mostly worn off by now, and hopefully a greater degree of objectivity can begin creeping into our respective analyses. So chapter one, let's start with the full story of the prologue comprised of episode one, The Vulcan Hello, and episode two, The Battle at the Binary Stars. Uh, I don't feel a huge need to go through the specifics of these two episodes. We pretty much know what happened. You know, Michael Burnham serving on the Shenzhou as the executive officer comes upon the Klingons, accidentally starts a war. Captain Giorgio dies, which sucks. And uh, Michael gets sent to prison for mutiny. And uh, that's that's pretty much the broad strokes, I think. So the time for analyzing every story beat has passed. You guys know what happened. I know what happened. And conceivably, our listeners know what happened. So first things first, we all seem to feel pretty strongly way back in our first episode that this may be the strongest initial showing from a Star Trek series, certainly in the modern era, but perhaps even including the original series. How do you guys feel these days about the show's prologue, especially now that you know what the full season ended up looking like? Rachel, start us off. Um... I mean, my uh, my initial response was that it was too action packed. I think was is that correct? I think so. Yeah, and so I think that the I was happy that the rest of the uh, series had a more bit more meat and uh, weight to it mm-hmm. that wasn't just action packed. Slowed things down. Uh, yeah, so I like that. Um, I generally think that I didn't need the prologue to understand the rest of it. I could have not watched it. And I think I still would have gotten most of the rest of the episode. So I don't know if, Mm -hmm. if that's necessarily good for the prologue. Um, (laughs) But yeah. But still generally positive, generally positive, but you know, not gushing, not gushing in the sense that you were after you first watched it. Has it maybe gone down a little bit? Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little. Yeah. Okay. Sharif, what did you think about those first two episodes? I thought they were amazing, um, but they instantly had me worried about the rest of the season. Oh, really? Because as we said before, they packed like, this was like maybe three or four episodes that I would expect of a Star Trek, of a traditional Star Trek pacing. Uh Uh-huh. They fit into two. So my thought was, well, they front-loaded this so they could sell CBS All Access. (laughs) <laughs> and the rest of the season is going to just feel like completely different pacing and it's going to feel weird. Um, so I liked it because I was like, wow, that was like a rush. And I was not expecting it to to really pop off in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, especially in like a retrospect, I still think that the death of Giorgio was unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that it was done just to sympath, just to, just to create some sympathy for Michael. Um, and especially after seeing the whole season, I'm even more convinced that, you know, um, uh, that it kind of hurt the series for me. And I don't really see a thematic reason behind the like sympathy, which you should already have based on just her life and, you know, and, and, and her being arrested and all that stuff. Sure. Um, yeah. So it felt like it was going way too fast, which I liked, but 
I was like, how are they going to maintain this over a season? Mm -hmm. Sure. Zachy, the prologue, how does it sit with you now that you've had time to sort of examine its place? Uh, I think I think what we said earlier in the season, where uh, in it, with the benefit of hindsight, it might have been a good idea to just start with season three. Uh, sorry, with episode three, and weave in what we got in episodes one and two via uh, nested flashbacks. Uh, mm -hmm. I I I do feel that way. I mean, I I think that uh, it, what we had was basically two episodes of just backstory. And I, I, I think I said this where it was like, it was like taking the first 15 minutes of the 2009 Star Trek movie with uh, Chris Hemsworth and his sacrifice and stretching that out to, to two episodes. Uh, it's, it's cool and it's interesting, but it's not the story. The story doesn't truly start until episode three. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, that information I think would have been more appealing if it was being parceled out to us, uh, where we're trying to kind of figure out what's going on. I like the idea of coming in and here's our main character and everybody hates her and we don't know why. Like that, to me, uh, feels like a, a better way in. So if you, um, I, I assume that at some point, whether it's a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, maybe 20, uh, that you will rewatch this season at some point? Possibly, yeah. Uh, if you do, will you begin at episode three or will you begin at episode one? No, I mean, I'll watch it the way they gave it to us. I mean, can't do anything about that. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to do like machete order, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, that's, that's my point is like the stuff that we got in them first two episodes, I think could have been, been done as a series of flashbacks spread mm -hmm. out through, you know, the first like several episodes. And I think that would have been an intriguing ongoing like, like kind of like lost where you have two narrative threads where you're and and they they end up together at some point you know mm -hmm. sure yeah i i agree with you in general i just don't think that with launching cbs all access that they could have afforded to do that mm. because the the they weren't only trying to get star trek fans that they know are going to stick around they were trying to get people that had a slight interest and I think people check out so fast from things that they don't get in, like everything kind of thrown at them that that's why they chose to sort of throw it all in there. So but, I, I, I mean, I, I, I would prefer to be more uh, slow and kind of dispersed, um, but I don't think that would have been the wise move given that they're trying to sell this service. What, what's funny though, is that just anecdotally uh, I've spoken to several people who are casual Trek fans at best and even fan might be might be overstating it but they tuned in to like the you know the, the pilot that they showed on CBS and they were like this it, it, what what the hell's going on you know and and <laughs> and and literally uh, uh, I, I said hey well check out the third episode and see what you think and and I, I got this from multiple unconnected people who were like that should have been the first one which is kind of why I, I'm, I'm like, well, yes. I mean, maybe, maybe that might have been a better way to approach it, you know? Mm -hmm. Cicero, what's your take on all this? Uh, I agree with Sharif. Um, I really loved uh, the first, um, that, that those first two episodes, I agree with, with Reef, um, that, that they were trying to come in with a bang and give, give, uh, casual fans uh so you know kind of whet the appetite of people to to entice them to uh subscribe to the service but also i i liken it to uh and i likened it to that after our analysis of episode three um the very beginning that first intro movie of battlestar galactic right um where where uh this gave us this kind of set the scene for what this version of Star Trek was going mm. to be. Now it, it 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 definitely it definitely changed once we got to the Discovery and we got to that crew and and especially that mm. captain. Um, but but we were able to. I think this was something that we were able to glean as a result of having the, those first two hours was the depth of the relationship and the and the level of admiration that that uh burnham had for sure um and and 
just how you know how great that betrayal was mm-hmm. um and, and you know and it gave gravity to her death now i do agree that she needed to <laughs> die um and i i you know i think that you know in order to to have uh michelle yo like Mich- there, michelle yo had to be gone or jojo needed to be gone from the series in order to allow uh burnham to to have this arc and and then also ultimately michelle yo is michelle yo so she couldn't be a regular on the show. So, I mean, she had to go some way, uh, some way, shape or form. Um, so I, yeah, I really enjoyed those first two episodes. Um, I, I love the fact that they were, they are, they're kind of by themselves, but they definitely set up that the new version of the Star Trek universe for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very understandable. Um, when the, when the first two episodes first aired, I was kind of under their spell quite a bit. Huh. Uh, in fact, for a while, I think that uh, those first two episodes together may have constituted my favorite opening salvo for a Star Trek show. I don't feel that anymore. I think that their luster is kind of worn off a little bit. I still would probably give that to Emissary, uh, the pilot of Deep Space Nine. Yeah. But it is a very strong showing. Not because, uh, I mean, I think that all of you guys are right to to varying degrees. Uh, there would have been some benefit in hitting the ground running and showing us from the beginning, you know, starting with that sort of intrigue, uh, disorienting angles, like why does everybody hate our main character? I think that that would have been attention grabbing. Uh, but, you know, I also see Sharif's point that, they needed to start things off with a bang in order to try and encourage people to sign up for the streaming service, uh, which worked anecdotally, at least from my perspective, worked in some respects and didn't work in others. But uh, overall, I mean, the thing that I attached to the most in the first two episodes probably is Captain Giorgio. I found her to be just very fascinating as a character and as a leader. Uh, I'm only endeared to her more, especially after reading the Drastic Measures novel. Um, she, she, there's a significant amount of potential to explore the past and present for Captain Giorgio in the canon going forward. Whether that's in the show or whether that's in expanded universe material, I will get more Giorgio stuff. It's just <laughs> a matter of putting it in front of me so that I can give you money and buy it, CBS. <laughs> uh, but overall, yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily think that from a from a perspective of narrative construction that these first two episodes uh, are particularly heavy. I like some of the ideas that they play with, especially when it comes to introducing us to the ideology and philosophy of Takuvma and sort of that Klingon nationalism. That, to me, makes the show seem like it's trying to be of its time. And uh, that I find very fascinating. But, you know, when taken as a whole, especially in hindsight for the whole season, it's lost a little bit of its luster, but no one can take away the artistry of those first two episodes, just from a visual perspective alone. Uh, So it's it's definitely a, uh, a, a episode or episodes to watch from my perspective. But uh, why don't we move along a little bit? What about those first two episodes of anything stuck with you the most when watching the entirety of the season? I think we kind of have hit on that with some of us that it's probably the relationship between Michael and Captain Giorgio because that's a thread that runs through the entire thing, even up to the point where she's looking in Giorgio's reflection's eyes. Uh, Cicero, what stays with you from those first two episodes the most? It's it's. It's definitely the relationship between Giorgio and, and Burnham. Um, they, there's definitely, uh, you know, immediately you get this, this sense of, uh, mentor, mentee, um, and, and a respect level. So it, you know, and it's a, it's a, uh, two way respect. Um, you know, the, obviously Burnham respects, her mentor and, and her superior in Giorgio, but, but, uh, Giorgio clearly and definitely respects the, the angles, um, from which Burnham thinks, uh, you know, that mm-hmm. this, this, the, this Vulcan side of her upbringing, the, the logical side of her, um, definitely brings a perspective that, 
that Georgia really, really respects and looks for. Um, and that was that's something that you really get a, a sense and understanding of during those first two episodes. And of course, you you understand intellectually how great Michael Burnham is as a character. Sure. Yeah, I can absolutely understand that. Rachel, what uh, what sticks with you from those first two episodes? Um, Takuvma's annoying voice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh when Admiral Brett Anderson's um ship, I forget what it's called. Oh, when it goes down. Yeah, when it gets rammed Clear. by the cloaked Klingon vessel. That was cool. Yeah. So All right. Very well. Zachy? Oh, just the Klingon grunting and how <laughs> little, little did I know the special place in my heart it would take up for uh, the next several months. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Under, understandable. <laughs> Sharif, how about you? I think the fact that we got a lot of Klingon only scenes. Okay. Um, which I really liked um, because it definitely gave me a sense that they, that the Klingons weren't going to be just these like angry warmongering um, one dimensional characters that they were actually going to get into the fact that there's these fractured houses and that, you know, there's rivalry and jealousy and there's like, you know, sort of like the, um, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of other things going on opposed to them just like being like, let's kill everyone. Um, mm -hmm. so that really stuck with me and that really gave me optimism, um, that the rest of the season would not only focus on the crew, and just make the like uh, Klingons like these like you know um, black box enemies, but that they mm -hmm. would actually focus on them as like developed c characters as well. So so like that really stuck with me, and like I think it paid off through the through the season as well. You know, yeah. I was I was just about to ask if if you felt like that was realized, yeah. and, and um, you know I, I want to I'm going to derail things for a second, but I, I just want to say kind of like. As, as Sharif was, was talking about that, it made me think about the, the season as a whole and how, uh, the writers had in introduced a lot of different things, um, and a lot of, uh, uh, or, or teased and titillated about depth, um, for, for lots of things, you know, um, the, the Klingons, the mirror universe, the, the universe, at, at, at the prime universe as a whole. And I felt like they scratched the surface on a lot of those things just to push some other plots forward, but never, uh, you know, never delve deep enough into those things to make what we went through worth it. Like, I don't feel like we got enough of the Klingon, like we did understand that the houses were, were, uh, were uh, definitely at war with each other, but we never got anything above the fact that the, 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 the houses were at war with each other. You know, there was never really a why, huh. um, Here, here's, or how. Here, here's what I kind of, what I kind of think about that. What I hope, and granted, I have, you know, I have no idea what's actually going to happen, but what I hope is that this is still going to be an ongoing conflict that this show will hopefully establish persists even through established original series canon. And the reason that I say that is because, well, you guys know how I feel about Star Trek VI, right. my favorite Star Trek movie. Uh, Chancellor Gorkon is physically and, uh, and his name is even modeled after President Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And I would love to see the beginning of Gorkon's career as a Lincoln figure in the Klingon Empire. Because for all intents and purposes, that is what he is by the time peace is made with the Federation at the end of the and, 23rd and Gorbachev century. Gorbachev, too, because I think his name is modeled after Gorbachev. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Gorbachev and Lincoln combined makes Gorkon. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and, and that's an excellent point. But um, I think that there's there's a fair amount of uh, I guess potential in the idea of running with a narrative that resembles uh, sort of unifying the nation after the civil war in that the Klingon houses are divided. They have stated in dialogue that the Klingon houses are divided, that there's not a very strong leader. We're getting indications from some of the production personnel 
that uh, the Klingon uh, council isn't necessarily concerned too much with keeping Laurel in power. Really, we a know female work on is alive. In, in power. They've got problems with that. Go cool figure. <laughs> well, apparently, according to the production people, they've got problems with how she came into power. That's what they said. But I mean, yeah, there's probably Klingon chauvinism in the 23rd century is also a documented thing. So that's that that could very well be part of it. But but then again, I mean, Gorkon's daughter is named Chancellor, and it's not even like a thing. You True. Know? Yeah. Yeah. And so there's, I mean, there's there's a fair amount of inconsistency in Star Trek continuity when it comes to we that. Could, stuff. We could right, learn right. from the Klingons. <laughs> we, we could. We could. Apparently, we could if Janice Lester is to be believed. But uh, who knows if she was a reliable source, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, but I think that there is a, a, a significant amount of potential in seeing. That, uh, you know, you have this figure that we know is going to be important in the future of, of the Klingon Empire, actually serving to be a unifier, at least at the very beginning of his career. Obviously, it can't be realized. But, but that's, and that's, I'm very curious about that because, because the Klingon chronology is like, it, I, that's, it's, it's like the, the, the big wide open. I mean, nothing right. has really been filled in, right? So, mm-hmm. like, if, if, if we, Follow the parallel that Gorkon is Gorbachev. Who is Khrushchev? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, that's a really good point. Or, ha- or have we met him? Or I mean, you know what I mean? Like that's really interesting to me. Uh, but I mean, I would think that there's a significant amount of potential in something like a Klingon civil war among the houses. Bring on the grunting. Bring on the grunting, right? But but <laughs> I mean, there's so much antipathy between the houses. Yeah, that. It seems like the way the primary way that Klingons resolve their conflicts is through combat. And it, throughout the original series, there's no real indication as to what kind of state the the Klingon state is in. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that might be I mean, obviously I'm writing my own script <laughs> and that's totally irrelevant. But I mean there's there's that kind of potential, I think, in 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 the Klingons if that's something that's attached to. Uh, in season two. CBS, if you want to buy this script. Um, <laughs> if you're listening. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. I've, I've, I've written uh, enough of my own script, I think. But, uh, last thing I want to ask you guys about the, the prologue. What do you guys think about the promise for the show that the prologue represented, but placed in the context of the full season and the finale? Did the season as a whole deliver on the promise of the prologue, or is that question totally irrelevant to how you perceive Discovery right now? Rachel? I mean, I think it surpassed whatever promise of the prologue that was given. Um, I don't know. If I had to define the promise of the prologue, I would think that it was just, you know, going to be like movie quality action Mm -hmm. fast paced and it was fast paced the the whole season but um i think that thematically there's a lot more depth and richness Mm -hmm. in the rest of the season um that you wouldn't get necessarily by just watching those first two episodes yeah i think so um you know now that we've been talking about the klingons i think maybe there was some promises implied there that weren't fulfilled and mm-hmm. that we didn't really get to know the, the Klingon uh, politics in, in a very deep way. Yeah. I, um, totally wide open. Yeah. So, you know, some things surpassed, mm-hmm. some things missed. Sure. Yeah. Understandable. Zachy, do you think that the promise of the of the first two episodes was fulfilled by the season at large, or is does that not even enter into the, the equation for you? Uh, it it doesn't really enter into it because because as I said earlier, but because of the fact that it is a prologue, uh, the I feel honestly like the show proper didn't really start until. Uh, the beginning of, of episode three. Yeah. So, so you, I mean, w- when I alluded to, you know, the first 15 minutes of track 09, that's almost how I view uh, these first two episodes. So it, mm-hmm. it, uh, like Rachel said, it sets a, a sort of a, a, a tempo uh, uh, of what to expect, you know, stylistically, but I, I don't think the first two episodes are an accurate representation of where the show proper uh, ended up going. Sure. Cicero, what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I'm nothing if not not contradictory. Um, I think it's you know after I just uh, wax poetic about the first two episodes, I think it was it was pretty irrelevant to uh, <laughs> to, the, to the rest of the series. Um, you know, I think it. I, I, so I still think that it set a good precedent for the expectations for uh, the quality of the show, and I think that um, narrative wise, it, it allowed us as the viewer to really learn our primary character and understand the relationships and and the and the overall arc uh, that that our character was going to take the hero's journey that the, that our character was going to take over the course of the the of the series. Um, but it uh, you know really outside of setting up the the. Uh, you know, lighting the the match that of the Klingon war that was, uh, it really didn't do anything for the overall arc of of the series um, as it as it stands. The you know the other thirteen episodes. Right. Um, so yeah, it was it was irrelevant. Even though I just also said it was irrelevant and made points to support that it was important. So I'm <laughs> I'm awesome. <laughs> Sharif, what do you think? I think irrelevant is a pretty strong uh, word for it. I don't think it was completely irrelevant. Um, I think that it showed sort of the creativity of, you know, of Michael and like Giorgio in terms of like how they got on the Klingon ship by like, you know, putting the bomb in the coffin. Um, mm-hmm. I think that as I spoke earlier, it, it, it kind of introduced you to the fact that the uh, Klingons, um, you know, would be more than, than the, than the one dimensional characters. I think that the point about like the quality of the show, like the sort of in the, in the music as well, I thought was, was like, well, and it just should, it kind of set my expectations as to what this kind of Star Trek was going to be. And that I, and that mm-hmm. I needed to remove sort of my previous, um, guesses as to what kind of pacing that felt like it would be. So while I do agree that, starting at three and having flashbacks would also work. I don't think these were irrelevant. I, th- I think that it was, it was a good way to kind of say, okay, we're back in some Star Trek stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, as I said before, I like them. I think that they were effective and they did their job. Um, and I think that it delivers on the Klingon side of things. And I definitely do think that it shows you a bit of what Michael lost Um, and I think that that kind of makes you understand more her personality, especially in the next, like, say, four or five episodes and why she responds to things the way that, like, as she does, I think they plant the seeds in, in, in the prologue. Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. Uh, all right. Well, um, let's move on to the remainder of chapter one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and run through the plot really fast. And for our, uh, and for our listeners, just so that they know where we're at in the conversation. So the biggest beats of chapter one are as follows. We meet discovery, captain Lorca, Lieutenant Stamets, Saru in his leadership role, Dr. Culver and the bridge crew, Burnham discovers the truth of the spore drive and they encounter the tardigrade and discover how it interfaces with the drive. The tardigrade is set free and Stamets begins serving as the spore drive's navigator. Takuvma's followers were drawn to call and Volk was told he needed to sacrifice everything. Captain Lorca is captured by Klingons, meets Harry Mudd, us out with Lieutenant Ash Tyler and recruits Tyler to Discovery. We discover a possible source of antipathy between Michael and her adopted brother, Spock, when we learn that Sarah chose Spock over her to enter into the Vulcan expeditionary group. Samets, becoming unstuck from time via the spore drive, ends up saving the crew when Harry Mudd manipulates time to find out Discovery's secret weapon for the Klingons, which in turn causes Burnham and Tyler to become romantically involved. Finally, after trying to save the planet from becoming victims of the Klingons' onslaught, a final battle is joined between Discovery and the ship of the dead, which results in Cole's death, Laurel's capture, and the ship's destruction. Admiral Cornwell, known Lorca for a long time, wants to try and bring the captain back to the Federation due to some alarming changes she's noticed, but instead at the conclusion of the battle, Lorca changes spore drive settings at the last second and the ship appears stranded somewhere. Whew. Okay. Did I get all of that? Uh... Yeah, I think you did. <laughs> All right. Well done, sir. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, if anything, I think it's uh, relatively safe to say that chapter one of the season was in more traditional territory than we would get in chapter two. Now that we're on the other side of the full season, how do you think chapter one holds up when compared with what would follow? And why do you feel the way that you do? Let's go to Sharif. 
Um, sure. Uh, I I do think that it holds up a lot. Um, I think that this is where you sort of, you know, really get to know like the you know like Lorca's crew, um, Lorca himself, and and like sort of the like the the like relationship that Michael has with like with, with like Lorca and with Sarek as well. Um, I think in general, I got the sense that Michael is sort of always looking for someone that can sort of replace the Giorgio like relationship. So she's looking for sort of different, different attributes in different people. And I think that she sees like some of that in Sarek and like some of that in, in like a Lorca as well. Um, and mainly one thing that kind of annoyed me was just seeing all these people in the crew that never really got to really speak, but what were in a lot of the scenes when like uh, they were, action so like i was always like man I, I i hope we learn this person's name or like i hope that that this cool person that looks like they're like a half robot that we learn like something about them <laughs> um you know so um yeah i i i i think that it like holds up i don't think the mirror stuff would hit as hard if you weren't as familiar with the uh you know with the prime versions of the characters mm -hmm. um and uh, yeah i I think that once the pace slowed down a bit, um, I think that it's started to really get into a, a nice groove. I in particular loved like the uh, choose your pain yeah. um, episode. Um, I just thought that like that was just a uh, cool theme. Um, obviously, Harvey Mudd. So, sorry, Har <laughs> Harry Mudd. I don't know. Harvey Dent. I keep thinking of um, of, uh, of uh, Har yeah, Harvey Dent, from like uh, Batman. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, so so um, I really liked um, you know th that episode a lot, um, and and like yeah, I just I really felt very close to not only the the um, uh, the uh, people in the crew, but sort of the scientific ex explanations that like they were using for the sp spore drive. Obviously, as a physics guy, I was super into into that part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I also liked, you know, you know, this sort of the the relationship that you saw them have with the tardigrade at first, um, um, and then and then with the uh, doctor, it took like we got to make these jumps, um, sort of by any means necessary. I I thought that that was like a really good analysis of you know of like what of like do you put people or like uh, other things in like a harm's way just to achieve your uh, goal. So I, I, I really like the, the, uh, the uh, first part. I think it holds up well. Sure. Rachel, how does chapter one hold up, especially now that you know what will follow it? Uh, I think it holds up really well. The chapter one is my favorite part of the three chunks mm -hmm. that we'll be analyzing. Um, I thought it had a nice mix of uh, Star Trek stuff yeah. and uh more new style mm -hmm. gray area what's Lorca up to <laughs> I, I that was a nice mystery yeah, we were I think asking the that impending uh ashes Vok thing was very interesting um yeah and I think that the the pacing was right in this mm -hmm. in the first uh chapter here where it's you know it's fast it's as fast as we're accustomed to as modern tv watchers sure but it wasn't too fast um which is my main critique of chapter two is that it was crazy fast yeah warp nine you might say warp Tr like beyond warp, like <laughs> trans warp. Yeah. Oh, so we're all turning into lizards. Ludicrous speed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wrong franchise. Yeah. Very nice. Zachy, are you ready for for me to come back to you? I'm ready. Let's all do right, this. Man. Let her rip. I don't know, man. Come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 interesting because because really like uh, listening to you uh, do your your recap made me remember a lot of stuff i'd kind of forgotten about to be honest because i do sort of just clump the whole like both chapters together so i was trying to process how i interfaced with the series you know 
not knowing, you know, like trying to filter out everything we learned in, in the second half. And it, it it's, I don't know, it's like meso meso for me. You know, I, as you guys know, I was, I was so digging the Lorca mystery. And I, I, for me personally, I, I didn't like the way they wrapped that up because it just felt, I mean, I'm not going to get into it. You know how I feel about the mirror universe, right. <laughs> but, um, so I, I remember really being on board with all all that. I remember being less on board with the spore drive as an ongoing concern, above and beyond. Like, oh, it's kind of interesting because it is. But it, I, you know, maybe this is like the like the dug in Trekkie in me, where I'm I'm like, how do you reconcile the existence of this with with everything we know comes after it? You know, because it's it's like a total game changer, sure. um, and so. I, I was on board for the mystery, and I like that. I, if I'm being honest, the first ha- none of the characters beyond, uh, uh, you know, Michael and Lorca, and maybe to a lesser extent uh, Stamets, really did much of anything for me in the first half. And I feel like that was a real debit. Like it, I think that's that's a problem with the 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 unfolding serialized, like the the really. Uh, heavily serialized nature of the show where um it, it was like running character development from episode to episode so you have like you know eight episodes later you're like oh that's what tilly is like and i i feel like uh that's one thing i like about you know the earlier trek shows is like by the end of the pilot you you know who everybody is mm-hmm. Uh, you you can you have a portrait of who everyone is, and I think I think that's bi- that in my opinion was kind of a failing of discovery in its early goings. Now I should couch that by saying that I I no longer feel that way because having gone through an entire season, I I do feel much better about the characters. But the, but by the end of chapter one, I didn't feel a particular sense of attachment to very many mm-hmm. of them. Sure, very understandable. Cicero, how about you, man? Uh, chapter one made recording this show so much <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, all of the all of the second spe- that right all all of the speculation um all of the the mysteries that were unfolding you know before us and and you know that's what made this show so intriguing and that's what made this uh doing debrief so much fun was was just <laughs> all, speculating about all the different things and and what was happening and and we lost a lot of that in season 2 because they they did you know they 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 microwaved uh chapter 2 and and uh and much like uh microwaving some food it it, it you know it kind of it was you know still tasted pretty good but it was it had a little rubbery aftertaste and and you know there were parts that were cold and then there were parts that were you know piping piping hot so um but but chapter 1 was was done prepared properly in an oven and really left you uh wanting more absolutely very well said as for me, I mean, in the context of the full season, I probably prefer chapter one, even though I see a lot of value in what chapter two added to uh, the potential for the continuity. But I mean, if I'm watching, if I'm going to do a rewatch of Discovery season one, these are probably the episodes that I'll enjoy the most, even though we know the truth about Gabriel Lorca. Um, I still find his character really fascinating, even if we know that, you know, that he's from the mirror universe. So Overall, yeah, I think chapter one holds up a little bit better than chapter two just because of the the pacing of everything. But over, uh, that's still I still enjoy the whole season, but chapter one might just be a little bit higher on the totem pole than everything else. So what we're actually going to do right now is stop it there. Uh, we had quite a lot to say for the entirety of season one. And I probably should have realized when I planned this that we would be able to talk for upwards of three hours if we're going to discuss the entirety of Star Trek Discovery's first season. So what we're going to do is hold off on the second half of our debrief of season one for next week's episode. So be sure to come back then. But as of right now, that's it for episode 18 of Discovery Debrief. We hope you enjoyed the show, and if you did, please like and follow us on our social media channels. And if you'd be so kind, we'd also appreciate it if you wrote a review for the show on iTunes or Facebook, 
It only takes a minute and we'll be happy to read your review on the air when it is posted. If you have any questions, you can follow the show on Twitter at DSC Debrief, where you can also find all of our individual Twitter handles. And feel free to send us questions through Twitter, our Facebook like page, or by emailing us at hailingfrequencies at discoverydebrief.com. Another special thanks to Sharif Jackson for joining us on this first half of the show, and he will be there as we continue to wrap up the discussion for Season 1. And remember, as always, to set your courses for this feed for future episodes as we prepare to discuss more about our favorite spacefaring franchise. As always, until we meet again, please go boldly, my friends.